When I first uh, uh, heard about the, the, the theme or the topic for this talk, uh, and being a language and literature professor, of course, I went into the etymological and literary research and uh, about Spark, and uh, then it came Cinder, and there came Cinder Ella. <laughs> Cinderella, because it's the, my Hispanicized version of the folk tale. Um, I'm going to speak about the many Cinderellas and Cinderellos, um, and about our heritage, our archetypes, and challenges, but this is not just about the people that I, um, I represent, but it's for everyone, right? For everyone, because as we uh, talk more about archetypes, archetypes, as you know, are universal. And we can all tap into them. And in fact, when we hear about archetypes dealing with uh, mythology, gods and goddesses, um, we tend to look at Europe, right? The curriculum tends to emphasize Europe. But today we're going to talk a little bit about indigenous Mesoamerican indigenous mythology. So a spark is a lively excitement in the figurative sense. In the practical sense, it can produce a fire or an electrical discharge. Um, sometimes this fire burns, burns very high, produces big flames, which causes um, the wood or the coal or whatever combustible material to burn quickly and turn into ashes. Um, however, if that passion is managed and we have cinders, right? Cinders are pieces of coal or wood that still have combustible material and that emit a soft, warm glow. And it is this, uh, this, this group of cinders that is going to keep us in our journey, right? The spark is the passion uh, that gets us going in the journey. But those cinders, those cinders um, are very powerful because as, as, as we balance that energy, it, it will extend the life if we don't blow too hard on those cinders. It will extend the life of that fire. And yes, at times, at times, our passions burn so, uh, so wild that what happens? What happens? We end up with, quickly, with ashes, right? And ashes, it's not necessarily a bad thing because ashes turn into soil, right? And soil produces again new life. So I guess my talk is about energy, how we manage that energy, equilibrium, which comes from um, indigenous spirituality. And um, you have there in that slide a group of Aztec noble women having a talk, having their, their moderate talk, balancing energies. Uh, that comes from the Florentine Codex, the book number 10, uh, which was one of the few books that were not burned by the Spaniards. So oh, why Cinderella? Cinderella is a folk tale with universal appeal, so it's full of archetypes <laughs> that we can all tap into. Um, the oldest uh, document dates back to um, China, goes all the way back to China, many, many, many centuries ago. And then the oldest European version, Cenenterola, Cenicienta in Spanish, um, is the oldest European version. 
Charles Perrault, French author, published it in 1697, but it was not until the Grimm's brothers, right? You've seen the movie? They um, put together a good number of folk tales and published them in 1812. And that is when it was massively distributed, translated into many languages. And um, the title was not Cinderella. It was Ashen Puto. Cenicienta. Cenizas is ashes in Spanish. Cenenterola is the ash, ashen girl uh, in Italian. So um, the uh, version that we are most familiar with is the Disney version. Imagine if, um, if we would have called it the ashen girl. That would have been very problematic. Um, so we ended up with Cinder, Cinderella. And um, Cinderella, the version uh, from the Grimm's Brothers, is very different from the Disney. Um, for one thing, the slippers are not gold. I mean, they're not glass, they're made of gold. There is an, um, a fairy lady that um, brings the, the dress and the, and the carriage. In fact, the Grimm's Brothers version is full of, of um, work between the human Cinderella and nature. It is the birds who help Cinderella pick out the lentils, the seeds that the uh, stepsisters throw in the ashes, uh, to keep her occupied, to extend the time that she works so they can go in and dance with the prince, right, at the palace. And so uh, the birds work side by side with the human Cinderella. And um, the mother, before she passes, and, and, and when uh, Cinderella becomes an orphan, says to her, you plant a tree near my grave, and, and when you have, uh, you need something, or you, are, or you are hurting, you come and shake the branches of the tree. So um, again, the ashes, the uh, decomposing body of the mother gives birth, gives life to this tree, and it is this tree that helps Cinderella. So again, we're seeing that process of, of nature working with humans and also nature becoming help and, and um, closely helping the human, which is not unlike um, gods and goddesses, um, I chose one European Greek goddess, one that I find fascinating, Hecate. Not Tecate, that's the Mexican beer. <laughs> Hecate. And she is the goddess of the crossroads. She fascinates me because she has three faces. And like the Mesoamerican goddesses that I have here, uh, also has a snake. Uh, snakes have been vilified in our culture, but uh, snakes have, have very, very powerful archetypes. Um, it, I don't know if you uh, notice in the medical uh, field, their symbol, it's, it's two snakes. And there are many explanations, but one of them is that um, a god had a pole that, that at his will could turn into a snake, and that pole was a healing pole. So, it was, and in Mesoamerican mythology, uh, snakes have the, um, the meaning or the, they symbolize rebirth, healing, and as you can see in the photo above, 
that is Sihuacoatl, um, goddess from the Aztec culture. Uh, she's uh, goddesses of motherhood and fertility, especially associated with midwifery. And it's associate, associate parallel, because also is a goddess of midwifery, is the Maya goddess Ishel. Um, they both have the snake. Um, the, the Aztec goddess is holding the tail of the snake, but on the other hand is holding an ear of corn. So um, fertility, life, healing. Um, indigenous spirituality is full of mythological gods and goddesses. We have gods that have both male and female um, elements. But at the center of indigenous spirituality is equilibrium. Equilibrium in everything. The best way that I can um, explain to my students what this equilibrium is about is by using visual aids. Um, have you ever seen the um, Chinese acrobats in person? Underneath all those girls, it's a girl that is just as small and skinny as they are driving a bicycle. And they drive it around this, the, the stage. So um, none of them is more important than the other. What, it, what they are seeking is to establish equilibrium. For instance, in the, in the sculpture with the stones, you have a big stone, and you might think that's the most important one, but is it? The goal is to maintain equilibrium. And so, contemporary indigenous Mesoamerican women who I study, are part of my research currently. Um, this is not something that you go and find in the library written by a, by a white man, why not say it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> they are actually meeting, meeting, uh, they met at the United Nations in 2002, and they began uh, composing, redacting their own memory, they call the document memory. And how do they tap into these memories is by, by oral tradition that their elders have passed to their daughters and, and sons. And so this is what they emphasize. Spirituality is at the top of their agenda and equilibrium is a big part of this spirituality. Um, so, um, in, in connection with, um, with, um, with the theme, I find that for me and for others, I, I have a, a, a perfect example coming up of a modern Cinderella. Um, it doesn't matter if the passion is too strong and it dies quickly. Uh, and then you gotta start again from ashes. Uh, how many of you um, has never failed? <laughs> I have. Um, so that's the, the, the ashes time, right? We gather the ashes, we gather the ashes, and it is those ashes that we learn from and we grow from. Those ashes are very valuable. And um, my former student, Lydia Razo, is a, a perfect example of a, of a modern Cinderella. And um, I get, I, I get an ash gatherer. Um, 
she was a third generation, is a third generation uh, Mexican who uh, was not allowed to speak Spanish in school, in Texas school at that time, and if she did, they punished her, uh, which didn't do much for her self-esteem. Um, not surprisingly, she married an abusive husband and who didn't even let her leave the house. She was beaten constantly. Her children were also abused. But she kept hoping for, a, for an escape, and at the age of 51, she finally escaped and ended up at a, a battered women's, um, a house that helps battered women. And it was there, and I'm quoting her, where, sh where I started, she said, where I started gathering my aches. She called them aches. And I call them ashes, too. She started gathering her aches, her ashes, and knew that education was the answer. So she went back to school, went to different schools, then had to stop because one of her sons got in a car accident. And to make a long story short, she ended up at UAFS, where I work, in 2014, was one of the best students, and graduated in 2015. That is my favorite Cinderella. And she does clean houses for a living. She used to clean homes for a, for a living. She, now she's a tutor um, at the university. She's looking for a job. But she still loves cleaning homes. She doesn't mind. To her, that's nothing to be ashamed of. So um, this is pretty much what I had for you. I wanted you to think of passion. Uh, the spark is very important. The passion can be managed as we grow older. We get, we, get more, we get wiser, and we can maintain those cinders, right? Burning, right? Manage the energy, equilibrium, right? But if it burns too bright, and if it turns into ashes, so what? We start over again, <laughs> right? Thank you very much.